Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations upon all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On September 6, 2018, an off-duty Dallas Police Department officer, Amber Geiger, entered the apartment of Botham Jean and fatally shot him. Bo, as he was known to his friends, was born in the West Indies in 1991. At the age of eight years old, he asked his father to be baptized. And his father said, no, 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 you're too young. So Bo came back to his parents at the age of nine, and then 10, and finally his parents relented. In his early teens, he actually began to preach to people about Jesus. He also taught music at his mother's uh, church choir. He actually came in and thought that they weren't doing a very good job, so he sort of changed everything. He set them up as altos and sopranos and tenors and basses, and he began to teach them a little music theory and a little bit about choir. At 19 years old, Bo wanted to attend a Christian college, Harding University in Arkansas. And he wanted to go to that particular university because he didn't want to lose his Christian identity as he went off to college. Upon graduation, he became a song leader at the the Dallas West Church of Christ. The Sunday before he was killed, like most Sundays, he was leading the congregation in song. Now, in a society where race is always a sensitive issue, the case exploded in the media. Amber Geiger is white, and Botham Jean was black. Geiger claimed it was a horrible mistake. She walked into the wrong apartment. In statements to the police, she said that she thought Bo was an intruder. A jury found Amber Geiger guilty. She made errors in judgment which could have been avoided. If other choices had been made that day, Botham Jean would be alive. The jury eventually gave her 10 years in prison. And before that, at the sentencing hearing, family and friends shared statements about how the death of Bo had impacted their lives. One person who spoke was Botham Jean's brother, Brant Jean. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just, I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past, each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know, I can speak for myself, I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. 
Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. Many of you probably saw that in the news. That hug. The media just just became very excited about it, showing it again and again. But at the same time, social media erupted. Many called out Brant Jean's act of forgiveness as misplaced. One compared his actions to those of a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder. He didn't understand what he was doing. If he did, he certainly wouldn't have done that. Another thought he was gaslight, gaslighted. That Christ Christianity had clouded his judgment, preventing him from understanding the underlying true justice issues. Now, many refused to condemn Brant Jean personally, but they criticized both the media and the culture for allowing that this heinous, horrible situation to occur, that Brant Jean could forgive this woman. They felt it was unseemly given the fact that Amber Geiger had murdered this young man. Now, some of the rhetoric that arose from this case was certainly heated and overblown, but I don't want to take away the real hurt and the pain that many were feeling. We cannot deny that many in this country believe that the justice system is stacked against them. Here's a case of a young black man, totally innocent, sitting in his own home, gunned down. None of us can bring Bo back. When Brant Jean offered forgiveness, it seemed to many that justice was short-circuited once again. She did bad things. She deserves to be punished. If you can understand that perspective, then you understand Jonah. For the past few weeks, we followed Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet of God. Back in chapter one, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, and then Jonah promptly went the other direction. In those early chapters, the book of Jonah was short on explaining the reasons for the prophet's resistance. However, it wasn't hard to speculate. I mean, the Assyrians were a horrible, violent people. They had treated the Israelites with contempt. They were scary. But that's not the reason why Jonah fled. So Jonah left. God brought up a storm and Jonah found himself overboard and in the belly of a fish. After three days, God rescues Jonah. The fish vomits Jonah onto the shore. Jonah knows that God has rescued him and God had given Jonah another chance. So when God tells Jonah once again to go to Nineveh and preach against it, Jonah reluctantly follows God's orders. Now, when Jonah arrives in Nineveh, he preaches, but his heart's not really in it. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Takes five words in Hebrew. Still, the message has an impact. The people of Nineveh repent. They show remorse for what they've done. They, they hope that maybe, just maybe, God might relent. So Jonah now, He's not happy that the people repented. In fact, he's livid. And finally, through all the chapters of, of Jonah, all the, the passages of scripture that we read, we finally are let in, the, in on the little, little secret, the dirty little secret, why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. He wasn't scared. He wasn't worried about the Assyrians. He was angry about God, who God is. Jonah quotes scripture to God. He says, you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. 
This is a passage of scripture. Those words, those direct words, happen again and again and again in the Old Testament. Exodus 34, 6, Nehemiah 9, 17, Psalm 86, 15, Joel 2, 13, just to name a few. The only difference here is that Jonah is quoting it negatively. It's not, oh Lord, you are a God of love. You are slow to anger, you're merciful. Thank you, God, for who you are. No, I know what kind of God you are. You're one of those gods that is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Cut it out. It is nice. Yeah, it's nice to be on the receiving end of your grace, but man, these guys don't deserve it. She doesn't deserve this. How dare you forgive her? And Jonah's essentially correct. They don't deserve God's grace. And a few years, Assyria is going to be trampling over the northern kingdom of Israel. However, today, <laughs> there's actually other places in the sermon that would have been more powerful, I think. <laughs> But today, God extends his mercy. But the fact is, we don't deserve God's grace either, right? God's grace becomes inconvenient for us when God is merciful to the people that we don't like. How could you forgive that woman? She killed that young man in cold blood. How dare you forgive her? The author Anne Lamott once wrote, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. Don't get me wrong, we should be on the side of justice. We aren't pushovers. However, God gives us no room to demonize our opponents. Someone after the last service came up to me and said, Pastor, does that mean we can't demonize Michigan anymore? <laughs> no, you're not supposed to. God loves people from Michigan too. He died for them. That passage from Deuteronomy is, it, in that passage of Deuteronomy, God tells the people of Israel, lays it out for them that you didn't do this. You didn't, you didn't build these houses. You didn't build these vineyards. You didn't free yourselves out of slavery. It was God that did this. And if you forget this, if you forget this, you are following another God. And you deserve God's wrath. All the passages of the Old Testament where it talks about how we're to be, how the Israelites are to be welcoming of the stranger, of, of bringing those in, is all pointing to that, to these, these same passages of Scripture, that it is, you need to remember who you are, who saved you, by whose grace are you saved, and because of that, you have no room to judge. You have no room to judge that other person. You're to forgive. Now, let's be Frank here, forgiveness is not about me saying, oh friend, it, it really wasn't a big deal. No, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. That Botham Jean is dead, that's a huge deal. But when his brother offers forgiveness, he's saying, I'm taking the responsibility for this, this idea that I have vengeance for this, that idea that I can take revenge on this, that I can be, hold this grudge against you for all eternity, I'm gonna let go of that. I'm gonna give it to God. God in his infinite justice, in his wisdom, in his grace, he's gonna deal with it because I can't. It's too much for me. God can deal with it. And God may decide to forgive. God may decide to relent or God may decide to judge. It's up to God. And I'm letting go. I'm gonna follow God on this. And in this way, God's grace actually transforms us, changes us. 
Anybody remember the hymn, Rock of Ages? One of my personal favorites. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Anybody remember? Free from wrath, save from wrath, and make me pure. Be of sin the double cure. That's always was a strange phrase for me. What does that mean, the double cure? Save from wrath and make me pure. Chapters one through three of Jonah are about God's grace freeing us from wrath. Whether it's Jonah who runs away, his, who is plucked from the sea and saved from the belly of the fish, right? Whether it's the people of Nineveh, Nineveh who have acted horribly but suddenly repent and turn from their ways and God saves them from wrath. God's grace saves them from wrath. Chapter four is about God's grace making us pure. At least the possibility. At least the possibility. Because really at the end of the book, we don't know what Jonah does. We don't know what his response is. In chapter four, we follow God's grace to its logical conclusion. God is inviting Jonah and us to join in God's compassion to the world. He's inviting us to take that compassion and to be able to show it to others. Even all those people that you don't like, all those people who don't deserve it. So where's Nineveh for you? It could be out there that great city of Norwalk, right? Walk in the streets, recognize and realize that some of those people in this town are pretty ornery. They don't deserve God's grace. But God loves them nonetheless. Maybe it's at that Thanksgiving dinner when you've got that one uncle who brings up politics and just ticks you off every single holiday season. You're called to love them. You're called to forgive them. Maybe it's that annoying person at the workplace. Maybe it's someone at school that has been treating you wrong. What God is doing is calling us to be in compassion with him. And in that way, he makes us pure. We're freed from the wrath, but we're also called to a life that's pure. Now, when Jonah finds himself sulking outside the city of Nineveh, he complains about God's mercy. And in response, it's so funny, the first time he says, you know, God even asks, do you, have a, do you have a right to be angry here? Jonah says nothing, all right? Jonah just goes out and sulks. There's no answer from Jonah on this. He just ticked off, goes off. Then... God sends a bush, a vine, to give Jonah shade. And then God sends a worm to destroy the, the, the vine, and it collapses, and the heat and the wind cause Jonah discomfort, and he just gets more and more melodramatic. It's better for me to die than to live. Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? Yes, enough to die. You were concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did, you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons? Stalin is quoted once as saying that a, a single death is a tragedy, a death of millions is a statistic. And isn't that the way it is? We're moved by the compassion for this stupid vine that was giving me shade, but not for the Ninevites, not for the animals. The question remains unanswered in this book. We never hear from Jonah again. We don't know what the, the final result of this. We don't know, did Jonah finally come around to accepting God's grace in this? Did, did he just sit there and sulk until he just 
disappeared because of all that anger and poison that was running through his system? We don't know. We don't know. But that's the invitation to us. What are we going to do with it? Have you come today here seeking God's mercy and grace? If you are, you are in the right place. The hymns, the prayers, the liturgy, the scriptures all point to a Savior who gave everything for you and me. Bertrand Jean is absolutely correct. Come to Christ. God will forgive you of your sins, no matter what they are. That message is for all of us. But do you long for something more? Because God is inviting you to something more. To be part of a greater mission to the world. To walk with Jesus along a very difficult path, which involves sacrificing love, sacrificial love. And God's amazing grace has a sweet sound. It saves us and equips us to serve. Amen?